everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Music Biz Weekly Podcast, brought to you by the fine people over at HypeBot.com. Thanks, Thank, Bruce. Thanks, Bruce, and everybody in the, in the HypeBot world for everything you do to support the show every week. Um, so, Jay, we have a special guest sitting in with us this week. We do. Coming from all the way uh, across the pond, from London, we have the founder and CEO of GigRev, and that's uh, Kevin Brown. Kevin, uh, thanks for joining us this morning. Thanks. Good to speak. So, so Kevin, fill us in. For those who don't know, um, haven't haven't heard of GigRev, fill us in. What is GigRev? What's 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 your business? Okay, so I was um, managing bands for quite a number of years, and uh, the biggest problem for me is that I, ban- I actually managed uh, what is the biggest tribute band, I think, pretty much in the world, a band called the Australian Pink Floyd. Oh, wow. um, yep. I had no rights in, obviously, the music, but we're a touring band, 120 shows a year, uh, wow. Making money on merch, making money on tickets, but no way to make money from anything else. So we're putting out video onto YouTube where we've got 70, 80,000 people on Facebook at the beginning. Um, but obviously, the content that we're putting out there, we're not generating anything from at all. So, um, so the aim, so Gig Rev came from the idea of thinking, well, you know, how, how do we monetize the fan base of the Australian Pink Floyd or any other band? Um, and how do you monetize a base of real actual super fans, even even with a tribute band, um, super fans that are willing to pay uh, or want to pay for more, but there's just nothing available to buy. You can buy the T-shirt, you can buy the DVD, uh, you can buy a ticket, but what, you know people want to do a little bit more than that. Um, at the same time, I think we saw that Facebook and every social social channel, including YouTube, uh, the the reach for that was pretty poor for us, and it's declined ever since. And um, I needed to reach 100% of the fans 100% of the time, and I didn't have the budgets that that, that Pink Floyd would have to reach those people. Um, email was great, but provided a one way direction of of being able to message somebody. But how do you get that two way conversation going? Uh, we had a forum on the website originally uh, for Aussie Floyd, uh, but of course that that kind of moved onto Facebook, and now we're in a position that you know, the reach on Facebook is 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 really poor. So we started building out a app system, which is a white labelled app. It's pa- everything's powered by Gigra because the only important thing here is is the artist. Sure. Nobody's interested in Gigra. That's where the power behind the tech. Uh, so we would then build an app for a specific artist. Let's just take Aussie Oz- Floyd as, as an example. Uh, you download their app, and within the app, you well, first of all, you register. So you knew exactly the person. You knew their email address, something that nobody else will give up. And then within there, you, had, you would have something that felt a little bit like uh, Facebook, feels a little bit like Spotify, feels a bit like uh, Periscope for live streaming um, and YouTube, everything all in one place. And a place that you can also sell tickets um, or buy tickets as a fan and, and buy merch. Uh, and and that's, the, that's the core of what GigRev does. We provide individually branded apps for different artists. So would 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 in a simple simple analogy would you describe GigRev as a, a a mobile fan club app? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's exactly what it is. I think I think over the years there's been various different iterations of this kind of thing. So I think if you go back a few years you'd probably think of Mobile Roadie as probably one of the pioneers. Mo- 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 mobile Backstage was around for a while. Okay, I'm not aware of that one, but um, Mobile Roadie was one that I came across particularly. Um, mm-hmm. And I think they were kind of sort of first-gen uh, apps that are, that sort of were a place that fans could potentially go to in order to actually end up going back out to the places that you're trying to bring them out of anyway. So there were kind of links 
that would go to Facebook in their Twitter, an RSS feed for their news, uh, back over to um, iTunes for music. So I think great idea, but very, very early on in the sort of technological cycle of where apps were going. Yeah. Um, and I think. Well, I, I'm just curious, does, I haven't had a chance to go in and kick the tires, um, but if I'm an artist mm -hmm. and I sign up for gig rev, it sounds like this is kind of, you, now I've got the platform. Um, yeah. What would I do to populate that? Would it be an aggregate of my socials? Would I be able to stream my music from there, You know, either from another DSP or directly from there? I get that you can have direct communications and you can let people know about your tours and your new releases. And what would I have to do to populate this app? Right. The, the simplest way that this works is, um, well, I guess content wise you can either link to music on the big dsps or you can stream directly mp3s uh depends on your particular situation sure uh, for example we, we work with um uh, this is probably a really good example actually we, we we run the app or the fan club app for ub40 uh who've got a massive back catalog with owned by the uh, previous label, can't think of who, who they were on actually, um, but new material that they've released themselves since. So mm -hmm. in that situation, the old material will just stream via DSPs and the new material will stream by MP3 within the app and can be made exclusive to people that, that subscribe to the app. So the app's free for everybody. So you can download the app and you can install it and you can register and you can see what appears to be something like a facebook wall sure. uh, you can look on the menu and find photos videos music and each of these items can be either made to be free to everybody using the app or just for people that are premium customers of the app paying 4.99 a month which gives you access to all of their music all of their videos um, posts, live broadcasts, all, all kinds of things within the app. And what we're finding as a bit of a guideline is that with the right promo, um, you can get around about 15% of your Facebook followers onto your app with one or two simple posts. And about 1% of Facebook followers are likely to, um, to pay $4.99 a month for premium subscription. Is the, is, is the four ninety nine set by you or can each artist uh, set their own subscription fee? They can. You know what was interesting? I think when we, when we first started this, I thought this is a one ninety nine a month product. Uh, and the first client came along, it was a, a country act, and said, look, we want to do four ninety nine. I really didn't think it would work. I thought it was overpriced and, and it just wouldn't, wouldn't do the job. Interestingly, they had 18,000 people on Facebook which then translated into 1,200 people on the app within a few days. Wow. And 220 people paying 4 99 a month. And that's been going on since September last year. And we've hardly had any drop-off from that. In fact, it's now grown to about 340. Which that's great. A quick bit of maths is... Uh, da -da -da -da. Uh, what's that? What's uh, da -da -da -da. Well, while you're doing that, how do they make it compelling? You know, if whether it's this band or another band, what do they offer each month that you find that the fans are drawn to that they yeah, feel you know, like it's a good you know, value? Um, we, 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 as as artists and marketing people, you know, we've got our fans that are used to living in the Facebook world. They're used to living yeah. in the Twitter world or the Instagram world or whatever gets delivered there. Really? So how, how do you, as an artist, um, differentiate what you're going to give out on Facebook versus what you're going to keep for the app, and then even within the app, keep behind the paywall? Yeah, what lights them up? What, what motivates you know them what? to do that? It's a little bit chicken and egg. I think what happens is... I mean, we advise a couple of things, but mostly it's not about necessarily making more material. It's about windowing it in the app and making stuff available earlier to your super fan than it's anywhere else. Now, you can't do that in every circumstance. But, for example, uh, we've got an app called Raven Eye uh, with 25,000 people on social medias. 
uh they uh did something called van hangs where they just filmed themselves in their tour van on a tour i think with kiss um and they did that every sort of week they put that onto youtube every single week uh since launching the app they've now made that premium content within the app and not now updating youtube for months after they did the same with the podcast actually which i never even thought of this but they use the the audio section uh, they do a, a, a bi-weekly uh, podcast of the band chatting rubbish, really. But it's fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they make that available within the app. And then three months later, they put it on to uh, all the same places you guys put. How, how, you know, how would you differentiate GigRev from something like Patreon? You know, it's really similar. I think it's very, very similar. But I think the key difference is... If you give the artist all the tools to do everything on their mobile in front of them when they want to do it, so if they want to go live, they click a button, they go live. If they want to upload upload a post, they can just click done. If they've got it on their phone in front of them, they'll do it. I think with Patreon, you've got to make that effort to go to the website, upload Mm -hmm. the video, make the comment, really think about it a little bit more. But I think if it's there in your hand, as a, a, a in the same way that. Um, Facebook or, or any any or Instagram is, is is easy to update. This is easy to update. So I think that's probably the key thing, and also the fact that you know most traffic these days is is mobile anyway. Um, sure. So that's it's right. Just the right place to to do this. Is it easy for the artists on the platform to reach out to their followers, trackers, like it is? say on bands in town or you know i'll back up the the thing that's really maddening about some of these socials let's say facebook is that in order for you to reach as you mentioned your fans uh you need to pay number one but number two that's no guarantee that you're going to reach 100 percent of the people who want to follow you is there a way in this platform where you can give them monthly updates and reach out to your fans and let them know to come back to the app to kind of remind them that it's still on their phone. And, Cause and, you know and, how and apps are. A lot of people don't to, use them. To, to add to yep. Jay's point, geo target that connection. So, you know, do I, I, I want to send a message just to my fans in Europe because we're going to be doing a European tour. Yeah. Yeah. Well, to answer the first thing. So all of the data that's in the app, this is right now to email address belongs to the artist. It doesn't belong to us. So take Facebook, flip the model on its head. You're the social network. Your fans are the actual, are your fans. So there's no, there's no gatekeeper in the middle that owns that data. It's you that owns that data. So Got you it. the email, you can notify hundred percent of the people with notifications um, at the time. So that they're your fans. They don't belong to anybody else, which is the way it should be. Sure. You know, I mean, we've all been kind of a, a little bit, in hindsight, tricked into using, into into using Facebook and and, and, and social networks, particularly Facebook. I think, uh, thinking that that relationship was always going to be there, and then all of a sudden, I guess right. over time, it's been dwindled into virtually nothing. I mean, I'm I'm seeing virtually no organic reach for posts now. Yeah, it's uh, it's, it's, it's challenging. Yeah, I think yeah. I think Facebook's had a problem that, of course, you know, after the after various scandals this year and the fact that when you looked at your Facebook feed, all you were seeing were, were ads instead of your friends. They've had to make a real big business change, actually. In fact, you know, now I'm seeing my friends and I'm not seeing many ads, which means there's less inventory, which means the cost of that inventory is going to be more. Sure. So and that, for me, I mean, that, that outprices it completely for an artist that that's end product often is the thing you're promoting on Facebook. Yeah. So your your revenue model then isn't ad based. It's based on a percentage of these premium offerings, correct? Yeah. So we've basically figured out that we we know that the we're going to get a lot of free users of the app. Now that's completely sure. free to the artist, and it's completely free to the fan. Um, we know that we can convert a percentage of those people into premium fans as long as there's there's premium content in the app. So um, we make our money on a rev split, purely on a rev split, 80-20, 80% to the artist. We take 20% of the uh, of that, that fee. Sure. And uh, an artist can sell this to 
a, a branded page that we built for them also outside of the app uh, that allows them to either just sell uh, a monthly membership, a yearly membership, or a yearly membership with a with a with a t-shirt or an album or something else included as well. So sure. you could effectively you've got um, I guess a hybrid between uh, a Patreon and uh, Pledge Music in that you've got this app that provides a journey to the album release, which you can pre-sell. So you can sell the one-year membership with the album that's going to come in nine months. You've got the way that you can um, bring the fan along the journey of recording and show them what's happening in the studio and all these yeah. cool things. And then drop the album, deliver the album, but then continue the relationship after yeah. the album's release, which I think is one problem for, for Pledge. Do you find it a challenge? Oh, go ahead, Michael. I was just going to ask real quick. Your your rev your eighty twenty rev split is that just on the membership fees, or is that on merch sales, music sales? Is that on any revenue sale? No, purely. You may, you may think we're taking a big risk on this, but we know the the conversion rate. Um, we just take twenty percent on on premium membership. So merch goes off to whoever you sell your merch with. Uh, tickets go to your ticket agents. We don't get involved with any of that at all. Now, interestingly, I think um, I'm I'm not sure if, if people are aware of this in, in, the, in the US as much as what we are in the in, in Europe. But bands in town, for example, um, because you've only really got I guess tell me if I'm wrong here. Uh, you've only got Ticketmaster over there. You've got the monopoly of the fact that there, that there's no affiliate commission on tickets. But what's quite interesting is uh, bands in town earn a commission on tickets being sold in Europe via the ticket agents that they are pushing people to. Um, I know that because I used to own the affiliate network, a company called Affiliate Window, um, that uh, that uh, bands in town uh, joined many, many years ago. And at the time were earning substantial amounts of money. Uh, mm -hmm. through affiliate links to European ticket agents. So what we can also do is we, uh, so the links that go into our system that go to, uh, to, to, to various ticket agents around the world, where we can, we'll also get a commission from the ticket agent, which we also kick back to the, uh, to the, to the um, artist. Cool. And, and, you know, and, and, yeah, I, I, having having grown up and done a lot of work in the affiliate world, um, you know, I pretty much assume every link that somebody's got somewhere should have an affiliate tag hidden to it somewhere. Somebody should be making a yeah. you know a few dimes off of it. And and mm. and my experience has been with most artists, they don't care. They're fine with that. If if if. If you're if you're taking a commission off of a Ticketmaster sale or an iTunes sale, but it's not costing me anything for the the service that the app the gig rev, that's fine yeah. because at the end of the day the artist just wants to sell a ticket and just wants to sell a download, and and yeah. if, if bands in town or gig rev or somebody's taking you know a two percent <laughs> affiliate commission because of that click through link. I, I have never worked with an artist that is like, no, 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 no. We want that affiliate commission. Right. Most of them are like, yeah, we don't care. Let them take it. They're not charging us anything. Yeah. Um, well, I think the answer to that is, I mean, we, we, we um, the gig listing widget that we that is part of the service, you can put onto your website as well. Um, and another, another a UK band, actually, a rock band with about 100,000 people on Facebook, yet can fill Wembley Arena, which is 12,000 people. Um, they had two shows go on sale. Um, and out of the 24,000 tickets on sale, we sold about 5,000 via the, the, the widget that gave them a commission and via the app, which I think was substantial. I mean, that was really, uh, and you're talking about 50, I'm translating from pounds here into dollars, but uh, I guess you're talking between 50 cents and, a, and, and, and almost a dollar a ticket that can be uh, paid in commission back to the, uh, back to the wow. artist. So, so now, that are, is substantial, it's worth, it's worth taking. Are, are the 
I just want to confirm. So links for ticket sales, VIP mm-hmm. merch sales, T-shirt sales, music sales, those can be any link that the artist wants to populate into the back end, right? They can. Look, you can't mess with the politics of tickets or merch suppliers. So we, if they want to link to the local theater or to Ticketmaster in, in Europe or to Inventim or to uh, C-Tickets or any of these different ticket agents around Europe uh, or, or the US, then that's, that's up to the artist. But what we do is we make sure that if there is a affiliate commission available, we'll make sure that they get it. Yeah, one of the challenges, I think, with uh, Patreon or Pledge Music or any number of these things, even with socials, is getting artists to actually do things for this. Um, They want to in the beginning, but then after time, it kind of wanes. And I'm wondering if you have any best practices that you share with artists or any ideas, because if they're going to offer something premium, then you know, month by month, they need to offer something premium and they need to keep engaged that way. And I've found that sometimes that engagement wanes. Is there any way that you kind of help artists to keep the momentum going? I think we're we're learning from the artists that we've built the platform for, I think. You know, I think every day is a learning curve. I mean, we initially, I think one one problem is for us at the beginning is we we assume that most people would take uh, a subscription in, in the app via uh, an in-app purchase, which of course Apple would take 30% of. Um, sure. So we launched a few artists by getting them to send out their personalized link to download the app or telling people to go to, go to the app store. Uh, but we found that, for example, by directing people to a page where the artist has a video set, giving all the reasons why you should use this app, uh, and join the fan club um, and then taking them into a credit card processing page uh, we found that that was that that was generating actually more people than in-app purchases and I think the reason for that is because you've got the audience you've got the ready-made audience already the the, the, the artist is promoting their app onto their social media platform and if the end goal of doing that is to generate revenue, then if there is a good time to spend money on Facebook advertising, it's then. So what we try to do is we, t- we, we I think we're learning that the better quality content that the artist puts into the app in order to get people to download the app in the first place, the, 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 the more take up of that they're going to get. So um, another artist that we work with, the band called the, the Pearl Hearts, um, only a small band, um, I think seven or 8,000 people on socials. Uh, they did an acoustic version of a song that wasn't available elsewhere, went onto their Facebook page, said, look, guys, download our app because you can, within this app you're going to get something you can't get elsewhere at all. And that generated probably about three or 400 downloads within a few days. Of course, then you've got the email. And, and more importantly, you've separated your followers from your true fans. So I think that's a really... I think yeah. that's becoming really quite important, I think, in my view. I think the older Facebook gets, the more followers you have that aren't interested in, in you anymore. I think, um, you know, what, 10 years, Facebook? Now, how many people like well, you, you know, it's, it's also a level of engagement, right? A lot of people will click like or follow. But yeah. this, what you're talking about with GigRev, that's a whole nother level of fandom and engagement, right? Yeah. I, I, I think you can easily say, well, just does this work for super fans but then you imagine a super fan with a tattoo of your of, of, of the singer's face down there on but i think there's a different i think you've got followers you've got social media followers you've got super fans and then you've got this other area of fan sure. and that's the that's the target audience for it and we're finding like i said unless you bought your followers and made a real cock up of your social media around 15 percent of, of of people on facebook are likely to be interested in downloading downloading your app and um, we see the board roughly a uh, quick question regarding tour dates um just be just because i know you know managing tours for bands you know we've got you got to put dates into bands in town you got to put your dates now into song cake you also have to build your facebook events um 
is it possible for gig rev to just automatically suck in dates from another source no i'll tell you why we don't do that because there's a lot of mistakes made i, I remember again looking back at, at the australian pink floyd we'd list bands in town on the on, on the official website but often see other pink floyd tribute acts pop up in our listings um and also um i know that most people take their feed from ticketmaster ticketmaster don't get the, sh the tour dates until it's already on sale now so what we try to do is we'll take the gig listings from the management prior to it being available elsewhere make sure it's ready in the system for the for either the release date of those dates or when it's not under embargo um we can do a pre-sale of that as well so we'll organize along with the uh with the promoter and the uh, acting on behalf of the artist we'll speak to the promoter get a pre-sale going for them and um and make sure everything's listed in the app so i think we don't pull the data in we'd rather take it directly from the from the management and get correct data get it ready and make sure that that the fans know prior to the on sale and the on sale and the pre-sale and all of those different uh those, those different dates and I think there's another good thing with doing that um, it gives us chance to also not only show the the, the, the listings or the, the, the ticket links that the promoter provides which often have an affiliate link in there as well um, but also allows us to find other ticket agents that have got allocations and give the fan the choice of more than one place which I think is really important I've seen Ticketmaster or Live Nation cock up on dates. You go on sale at nine o'clock in the morning, five minutes later, it's sold out because they've forgotten that their allocation is within a different. That's ticket. right. Yeah. And uh, how, how many times has that happened? So I, I, I like to give the, the fact that at the end of the day, it's the fan that chooses where they want to buy the tickets from. Um, and if you give them full choice of everything, then they can find the ticket. One of the great things about online and app-based solutions is you know you've got all this data that you're collecting what kind of stuff do you share with or do the artists have access to on the back end you know can they tell you you had mentioned email can they tell what country can they tell what device can i mean what kind of data points can people get on the back side well i mean all, really all of it i mean we i guess the thing is we, we've got an admin section that the artist can log into that will tell them uh, they can download their emails they can get all the data from everything that's happened in the app the bit that we're still building is is the the graphs that show that every every, every artist has got a, a different stat that they want so the thing that i like to think i'm, I'm really good at is collecting everything in the big database and saying or, or at least being in a position to say when you ask me for a particular stat I can pull that out of the database graph it give you the information and say there you go so we build the stats and we build the graphs that might be needed as and when people need them and I think that's that's we're, we're learning from what people want we haven't got a system that's complete but we have the data that's complete yeah yeah is there anything that you're looking at for future updates and revisions to the app is there any area that you are kind of looking at that you want to kind of move into a different direction yeah i, I think um i mean it's const constantly evolving so uh next week we launch maybe this is overdue actually uh but we launch a fan to fan wall so fans can post pictures and oh that's cool and, and it should be there you know you, you're going to get probably 90 percent of content is going to be fan driven. Fan -driven uh, so yeah. that, that launches next week. Um, the next thing we launch uh, for January is simple but really effective. Um, we know where you are uh, if you've got the app. That sounds <laughs> ominous. <laughs> yeah, is. But you know, I think the thing is we're giving something back. I think if you look at if you look at most apps or if you look at um, Google and Facebook, they know where you are, but they're not necessarily going to give you much back for that. They're taking your data, but really they're still selling to you. What we say, what we say to the fan is, okay, give, tell us where you are, because if you go to that gig, we can unlock something for you. We can unlock a song, an album, a live recording. Uh, okay, you might be able to stand right outside the venue and 
get just within the geo targeted area and get that free download but you can do that so i think um geo targeting allows us to unlock content unlock things such as uh, a meet and greet so if you're at the venue the artist will know that you've got the app you're in the venue and pick pick a winner um and i think really sort of I don't want to go too gimmicky. We really, it does what it does really well. Um, and I think you, I don't want to turn this into a gimmick. I don't know if you've seen the Taylor Swift app, um, which is uh, interesting. Um, great idea. I think it wasn't executed particularly well. Uh, it's almost a game. I think it's been over gamified. I think that's a big problem. Um, you can be very interested in that for a short period of time, but it soon gets boring. Really, what you want is a communication with the artist. Um, yeah. And that's what we try to provide. But um, having said that, we, we're, we're building, for one particular artist that I can't name yet, but we're building something similar to the... Um, the, the, the I don't know if you ever saw the Coldplay wristband that lit up at the, at the gigs. Sure. Mm -hmm. Taylor Swift did that too, yeah. Really cool yeah. idea. Very expensive, apparently. Um, but um, if you've got the app installed um, and the artist can the artist can send a signal, which is Bluetooth, because you're in a big metal frame building with no 4G at all, right. so work through 4G. Uh, so we send a Bluetooth signal, which in interfaces with each phone, and you can basically do a Mexican wave of of colours. Sure. Uh, with person's phone. You hold the phone above your head. Nice clear Bluetooth signal. We've we've tested this out. It works really well, um, and 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 you can make a quite cool effect across the audience. So we're, we're building that out for a particular artist that that's launched in January. If I'm a band and I sign up for for Gig Rev and now I've got this great kind of mobile fan club and I'm connecting with my artists, what is that app? Is it is it gig rev that I'm having people get to do this and then they sign up for me or is it like you mentioned before white label is it you know my band's name how does that work? Well, I think um, look you've got I think there's two types of apps out there you've got your uh, backstage or BKSDG uh, I don't know if you've come across that one and um, other apps that are basically social networks with pages within them. Uh, mm -hmm. That doesn't work because the artist only wants to promote their own art, their, their own app, and I think you know, give them an app with their name on the front of it. They're going to promote it. So you know, if you look, if you look to my phone, and you're not going to probably see it from here, but um, you know, I've got an app per artist. So you open, uh, if I was to open this app here, it's their app, and it's their content, and it's a slow connection here. Um, That's all right. You know, it feels it feels like Facebook. It's their branded app. It's got various things in there, um, and the same with you know, you can log into that app and you've got another one there. So every artist app is different, and um, you can see there's premium content on that wall. There's free content on the wall. The same when it comes to the live broadcast or music, everything in there is uh, choosable by the artist. So so every app has got a different is a totally separate app. That's super cool. Well, listen, um, Kevin, where can people learn more about GigRev and where can they find you on on the web if, if that's something you like? No, no, great. Um, GigRev.com. We're just okay. out there waiting. Um, and, uh, yeah, or give me a call. Can, can, on... can, can any artist sign up and do this or do you kind of uh, review artists for... Yeah, I think I think what we Working what we with. tend to do is we, we, we always look for artists with more than twenty five thousand people on socials. The reason yeah. being is you're just not simply gonna get enough people to get the art or keep the artist interested. If I know that if you've got twenty five thousand people on socials and you're pretty active socially, uh, then that's gonna generate around uh, two hundred and fifty subscribers. Bringing in uh, sure. that's tonight is awful. Two hundred and fifty times four ninety nine is uh, one thousand two hundred pounds a month. Recurring sure. every month um, or dollars, whatever. Yeah, and that's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Does that include like YouTube? 
Yeah, I mean, we have a look. If the artist, the artist can have a lot of people. I mean, we've had some uh, X Factor people approach us with uh, a million people. Sure. No, they're not engaged. They're not engaged people. They're, they're, they're people that have. That it's like a moment in time, yeah. So, you yeah. know, we have to look at everything. The, you know, the last thing I want to do and the artist would want to do is is, 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 is have an app that just doesn't work. It's no good for anybody. Yeah. Uh, it's a waste of time. Uh, if. You know, there's a lot of YouTubers that have followers. There's a lot of Instagrammers that have millions of followers, but there's no actual fandom there. Yeah. And I think, you know, I'm still grappling with how to work with or who to work with in the influencer world that's actually got a fan base versus just people sure. that like to look at photos. And I uh, imagine it's evolving as well. So what may be great today may not be great 90 days from now as well. So. Yeah, exactly that. Yeah. But uh, yeah. a, another thing, we have, we're have we working with a, a YouTuber uh, with, I think, around about 7 million people. Uh, per, 7, million, 7 million people on YouTube. has about a million views per video. So the idea with them, and they're with CAA um, in LA, um, that the idea with them would be to release the stuff that's going to be on YouTube two weeks prior to YouTube in the app and then on YouTube constantly promote the fact that you can see the behind the scenes footage and stuff that you can't find on YouTube now you're going to see it on YouTube in two weeks but now it's exclusively within the app and that allows uh, CAA to, believe, uh, to, to, to build a, a mailing list which they can't do through YouTube Right. Uh, and right. ultimately take this guy on tour and sell tickets and sell merch. Fantastic. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day, especially at oh, the end you. of the day from London to join us. It's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you very much. Really appreciate your time, guys. Really do. Thank, thank you so much, Kevin. Uh, I, I love these mobile backstage roadies fan club however you want to define them type apps i think there's a market for them it's just always been a matter of finding the app that is going to be around that you're going to invest your time in and building this and and you know i think the challenge i've always encountered and this is when it comes to any sort of a fan club creation is you have to really commit to doing this and sticking right. with it you can't yeah. you can't sign up for this app launch it and then three months from now stop yeah you, you got to be committed because if you if you do that your your subscriptions disappear the app will disappear you're you're, you're, yeah, you're, you're done. pissing off your best fans yeah yeah you, you know you you really have to understand all right i have to create a little extra content that is exclusive to the paywall on my mobile app. Not yeah. difficult, but you have to that has to be part of the whole process. Right. It Take a little planning. Yeah, you can't sit here and go, oh crap, I haven't updated my my gig rev app in three weeks. <laughs> I better throw something up there. Dude, if that's how you're approaching this, just don't do it. Wrap it up right now, close the door, don't don't even bother doing it. Fan yeah. clubs can be incredible tools. But they do require commitment and work. Yeah, absolutely. You ha you have to be engaged in it, and if you don't have that level of commitment, don't do it. It can't be an afterthought. It can't be a oh by the way type of thing. Oh, whatever right. we put up on Facebook, just give it to them in the app. No, that's not the whole. That's not the point of this. You need that's right. something exclusive. Yep. Good conversation. Yeah, awesome. I'm looking forward to checking out Gig Rev. So yeah, um, that's it, guys. Another episode of Music Biz Weekly Podcast brought to you by HypeBot. HypeBot. We're out of here till next week.